So this is lecture four for the anthropology of Asia, the Munda, and Adivasi tribe. So in the last lecture, we began to talk about the different sort of categories of people in India. We talked about the ethnic majority and the its category, right? And then we talked about other categories, including the idea of indigenous scheduled tribe or Adivasi. And so the Munda is one of these particular groups. And in India, they're considered a, a racially and linguistically distinct indigenous group of that eastern India region. Now, I use the term racial here um, in terms of the social constructed nature. So that is, in India itself, people think of the Munda as a biologically distinct group of people. Now, anthropologists uh, have been very critical of the biological roots of uh, race concepts, but at this point we are talking about the social understanding of race as it is in, in India. This is a really big group of people, if you think about it. You've got nine million of them in India, and then you have five million across the border in Bangladesh. You can see there uh, on the map that uh, you have Munda through the eastern and northeastern area of India. You have that concentration in Jharkhand, the, uh, the Chotanagpur Plateau. But you also see that there are uh, other distributions of Munda in other parts of India, too. The Munda are Austroasiatic speakers, and so they speak a language that's related to Khmer, the language of Cambodia, and as well as Vietnamese. Both are Austroasiatic languages related to, to Munda. And so in this particular lecture, what I wanted to do is provide a simple sketch, really, of Munda culture or Munda way of life. In anthropology, we define culture as a way of life that is shared and learned and is dynamic and changing through time. And so in this lecture, we're going to discuss some of the components of culture that I think are important before we turn our attention to anthropological writing and research with the Munda. So many people think of this way of life for human beings to be based upon a particular kind of subsistence or a particular kind of economic foundation. And so if we're thinking about Munda people, and we're thinking about their way of life, one of the first things that we can talk about is that they have a mixed economy, they have a semi-subsistence uh, economy, and it's grounded in agriculture. So in these Munda areas, many Munda are gonna raise livestock as well as grow uh, crops such as rice or corn, millet, uh, different kinds of fruits and vegetables. But they also gather different kinds of forest products too, like sow leaves. Now, in addition to these traditional livelihoods, if you will, uh, the Munda are also involved in out-migration for wage labor. So, particularly among younger, young Munda today, you have people who are out migrating from their home communities to work in various kinds of industries in larger urban areas in the bigger cities of, of India. So that's that kind of first layer, if you will, of culture, which is the, the subsistence and economic basis, right, for a way of life. But on that basis, right, of how people subsist, how they, they um, live their life economically, different kinds of social relationships and things develop. And so Munda context or Munda culture in this situation is very interesting because while they're citizens of the Indian state, you know, they're integrated into the broader society of India and the political systems, they also have their own distinct form of political organization. So this political form of organization that's unique to the Munda is called the Parha. And the Parha includes an organization of priests and priest helpers. And so when I, as soon as I say that, we're talking about social organization, an organization of priests and priest helpers here, you may uh, think, well, okay, what's the difference between religion and religious organizations, right, and social organization? And since we're dealing with a different culture, some of those categories are not the same as they are, let's say, in 
in English. So the Parha is an important form of Munda social organization and political organization, and it is also a religious institution. There is no boundary between those um, concepts or categories. So this Parha is made up of priests, priest helpers, and then village residents. The Parha brings together the residents with the priests and the priest helpers, and it's a place where there is religious ceremony, but there's also conflict resolution. Uh, the priests help village residents both deal with the sacred, right, and uh, dimensions of, of kind of the spiritual reality of, of the world, but it also deals with the mundane things of residents interacting with, with each other and the kinds of conflicts that happen locally within Munda villages and Munda towns. It's a really interesting part of their social organization. The priests uh, are believed to be chosen by deities and the deities move over people through time. So whereas Munda described this as almost like a possession, right? This deity inhabits the body and that person becomes a priest for a period of time. And then that deity moves to another person in the community who then takes up the role of priest. And so in many ways, even though we're talking about something that is um, very different in terms of its organization from, let's say, our own social organization, our own political organization, it has this element of democracy and that leaders are constantly changing because the deities who grant their authority to leaders um, do move. They do possess different people through, through time. So a little bit about the subsistence and economics, a little bit about the social organization, this, this concept of the parha that's important for Munda people. And when we're talking about the parha, immediately you know, we're talking about ideas about the worldview of people, how they philosophically understand the, the world. And scholars often call the worldview of the Munda sarnaism, like uh, if you think of Buddhism, right? or Hinduism and so on, that their religion is known as Sarnaism. And so the religious practice is kind of centered in a way on forests and forest groves. And there's one large festival known as the Sarhul Festival, which you can see here in just a few minutes, in which the, both the forests and forest groves, as well as single trees within the village context, are the center of religious practice. The idea is that these trees, trees that are important in Munda subsistence, that are important for Munda livelihood, so the sal tree leaves are used for many different things, from livestock feed to medicine, an important tree there in their local environment. Well, they believe those trees you know, are the manifestations of deities, just like these deities can inhabit human beings and transform them from an ordinary human being into a, a priest, the trees around them are also inhabited by these male and female deities. And so they are worthy of worship and offering. In the next clip, you'll see the Sarhil festival from Sarkhan that's become so popular regionally that many different ethnic groups, people from the majority, will all travel to Jar Khan to experience this Sarhul festival. समुदाय के प्रत्येक व्यक्ति को आनंद भगवान के ऊपर विश्वास एकत्रित होने का अवसर घर परिवार के दुख दर्द को एक निश्चित समय के लिए भूल जाते हैं हम लोग जंगल झाड़ का पूजा करते हैं इसलिए कि जब तक हम उसको
सरहुल पर्व आदिवासियों का सबसे बड़ा एवं आस्था का पर्व है So in conclusion here, we've been looking at uh, India and we begin to disaggregate India just like we did for Asia as a whole and start thinking about it rather than just one simple thing as a complex object made up many different parts. We started looking at the different regions of India and we began to look at the different human groups in India, the broader human diversity that we find there. One of the kinds of diversity is the minority scheduled and indigenous tribes. And for this lecture, we focus right on the, the Munda, one Adivasi or one indigenous tribe.